Fred, I just want to delve into this a little bit further because it's now regulator, regulated, you know, approved in the United States. It's been approved in Canada. But you just said that it's still not that easy to get access uh, when you're dealing with some of the big asset managers or broker dealers. Um, give us a little bit more granularity on that. And then if that's the case, where are people buying this through or how? Well, right now, the obviously the large concentration of wealth in Canada specifically, and 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 also in the United States, are by investment advisors that won't run what we call discretionary managed portfolios. The investment advisor gets to determine the asset allocation and select the product which they get to buy. But companies such as you saw in the United States, even though the Bitcoin ETF was approved, firms such as Vanguard, Merrill Lynch and some of the others are not putting it on their platform. So just because it got approved doesn't mean it's gonna be widely adopted by the firms, their risk departments and everything along those lines. And I think that that's what we've seen in Canada. We've seen a reluctance of the major banks to open it up to yeah. discretionary accounts. You can hold our products on any account at, at a, a Canadian bank, but it has to be requested by the client. Understood. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about why this is an interesting investment to begin with. You know, when you said that uh, a, lot, a lot of the um, wealthy families don't have exposure to this, what is the reason to want to have exposure? What are you, what are you communicating as you educate um, these family offices? Well, you know, a family office's responsibility is to both grow the wealth of the family and also to protect the wealth of the family. And I think that when people really understand the, you know, what Bitcoin is and what it's worth, Bitcoin with a big B is the most powerful secured computer network in the world. So when people say it's worth zero, I go, well, how can the most powerful secure computer you know, platform in the world be, be worth zero. So that doesn't make any sense. But, you know, as long as supply uh, in Bitcoin, which is relatively fixed, it grows at, it will be growing at, you know, barely 1% a year in the next four months, you know, that, that calls it a scarce asset. And as long as demand continues to grow and the fact that money's going digital, you know, and the blockchain is real, um, you're going to see continued increased demand for the next decades. And, and just like any computer protocol, you know, whether you're talking about email or live streaming or voice over internet protocol or any of these protocols, internet protocols don't disappear. They get stronger and bigger and more powerful. And that's the same with blockchain. Blockchain is the secure value transfer protocol. It's an internet protocol that you get to own. Can you imagine if you owned email? you know, 25 years ago. How wealthy are you today? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, when you talk, though, about the um, lack of supply available in Bitcoin, are you looking at it then from more of a commodity perspective and or are you looking at it more from a money supply? You know, when we look at these central banks around the world that have uh, flooded the system by just printing money, which has devalued the value of your money. Are you looking at it that way as well? It seems to have a few different uses, perhaps. Yeah, it, it, exactly. As long as, so all we see now, if you take a look at the last 14, 16 years, the use cases for Bitcoin get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they grow, you know, exponentially. And again, that, that's for all the digital assets. Digital assets are here to stay and they're going to keep growing. But Bitcoin is that unique characteristic that the growth rate of supply gets cut in half every four years. So the growth rate of Bitcoin was 4% six or eight years ago. Then it became, you know, 4%, which is the same as gold. Now it's 2%. It's going to go down to a 1% growth rate in April. And, you know, as long as the demand, which is way exceeds the growth rate of the supply means that the price should generally move in the same direction. And, and what are you seeing in, in terms of demand? Because I think a lot of people thought when we talk about digital currencies and digital assets that people would actually really start to transact more with Bitcoin. Have we seen a movement on that front? Doesn't seem like it yet. 
Yeah, again, too many people are still mixing, and, and you see this on some of the other TV stations. Oh, Bitcoin's not a currency. Well, you don't spend your store of wealth is the bottom line. You, you buy it, you hoard it, you hold on to it. However, stable coins, which are digital representations of current fiat currencies, those will trade now instantaneously securely around the world virtually for free.